Greetings and welcome to our debate uh, today between Dr. Michael Brown and Dr. Don Preston. The thesis for our debate today is, does Romans 11, 25 through 27, state that there will be a national turning of the Jewish people to God? Are there any Old Testament or New Testament promises made to ethnic Israel that remain to be fulfilled? This is a debate on eschatology. And it has a very specific focus. I would like to introduce our debaters to you and then give you an idea of what the format's going to be. And then I'm going to get out of the way and allow them to do the debating. Dr. Michael Brown is the founder and president of Fire School of Ministry in Concord, North Carolina, director of the Coalition of Conscience, and host the daily nationally syndicated talk show, The Line of Fire. He holds a PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Literature from New York University and has served as a visiting adjunct professor at Southern Evangelical Seminary, Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary at Charlotte, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, Fuller Theological Seminary, Denver Theological Seminary, the King's Seminary, and Regent University School of Divinity. And he has contributed numerous articles to scholarly publications, including the Oxford Dictionary of Jewish Religion and the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament. Dr. Brown is the author of 22 books. Dr. Don K. Preston is the president of the Preterist Research Institute, a nonprofit institute dedicated to the positive, to the quote, positive proclamation of the good news that we are not in the last days and the world is not just about to end, end quote. He has also written 22 books, all on the topic of preterist eschatology and has debated many leading evangelicals, including James Jordan, Joel McDermott, C. Marvin Pate, David Englisma, Randall Price, and Thomas Ice. He has served as minister for the Ardmore Family of God, formerly the Ardmore Church of Christ, for 16 years. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Let's talk about the format. Uh, the format is as follows. Each uh, gentleman, Dr. Brown, will be going first. Each gentleman will have 17 minutes to make his case. There will be a 12-minute rebuttal period from each. We'll maintain the same order all the way through of Dr. Brown and then Dr. Preston. There will be a cross-examination period, 15 minutes for each gentleman doing the questioning. So two 15-minute periods and then five-minute closing statements. Now let me just mention that especially in regards to the cross-examination, uh, that cross-examination needs to consist of the asking of questions, uh, not of the stating of positions or responding to the answer from the last question. Uh, it needs to be very much uh, uh, focused upon the asking of questions, uh, any other commentary uh, outside of just laying just the groundwork of the question very briefly uh, will be considered out of bounds. So I, I hope that we all can stick with that uh, particular uh, format. Uh, so this obviously, one more time, I want to make sure the audience understands the thesis statement before Dr. Brown begins his 17 minute opening statement. Does Romans 11, 25 through 27 state that there will be a national turning of the Jewish people to God? Are there any Old Testament or New Testament promises made to ethnic Israel that remain to be fulfilled? That is the thesis statement today. I hope as you listen, you will keep that in mind and listen very carefully to the presentations as they are made. And so with that, I would like to invite Dr. Michael Brown uh, to begin his 17-minute opening statement. Michael, your time begins. Great. Uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to do this. Thank you, Don, for uh, accepting the challenge to debate these. In fact, coming to me and saying, let's debate them. And James, thanks for moderating. Uh, what I want to do is scope out what Paul wrote in Romans 9 through 11 so we can get the larger context. And we can see without question whatsoever that Paul was looking forward to the future natural, national turning of the Jewish people to Jesus the Messiah. Uh, the context of Romans 9, of course, is Paul had not been to Rome. He wanted to make sure that the Romans understood the gospel message. And as he closes Romans 8, no one can separate us from the love of Messiah. The question could easily come up, well, what about Israel? What about the Jewish people? Paul's heart was heavy, burning over these issues because his own people as a nation had rejected the Messiah. He was wishing he'd be cut off from them. But he says this in Romans 9.3, they're Israelites, 9.4, and to them belong, present tense, the adoption, the glory, the covenants, and, the end of the verse, the promises. 
So the promises and the covenants still remain. There are many promises that God had given to Israel that had not yet been realized, including a national churning of the people, including the earth being filled with the, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the seas, accord, uh, uh, including the end of war and conflict on the earth, and including a national turning of, of many nations in the world to God. For me, the future is bright, as bright as the promises of God. I hold to an eschatology of victory, not defeat. God's purpose is being accomplished in the midst of conflict chaos here on the earth. Now, in Romans 9, 6, Paul explains that not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. In other words, there is a remnant of believers within the nation, the Israel within Israel. Paul never in his writings explicitly calls the church Israel or explicitly calls Gentiles Israel. He may call them the circumcision uh, in the spirit. He may say they're part of the commonwealth of Israel. But here he's speaking of the believers within the nation, the Israel within Israel. He uses it in that sense, but notice as he continues his argument that he is distinguishing between Jews and Gentiles. He is distinguishing between Israel and the Gentiles. And as he continues his argument in Romans 9, 10, 11, every time he speaks of Israel, he is speaking of ethnic Israel. He says in 9.24 that God's called people not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles, making a distinction between Jew and Gentile in the body. 9.27, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, meaning whom? The ethnic people, the nation. Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. And then he speaks of the Gentiles in verse 30, that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, but Israel, 931, pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in attaining righteousness. Again, Israel here is ethnic national Israel. He says he has a burden for them, for their salvation, that they may be saved. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Speaking of whom, again, ethnic Israelites. Then he says in 1019, did Israel not understand? Who is he speaking of? Ethnic national Israel. And then he quotes passages to say, no, they didn't get it. And then closes the chapter 1021 of Israel. The Lord says through Isaiah, all day long have I held my hands out to a disobedient and contrary people. So every time consistently, clearly, after saying there's an Israel within Israel, when he speaks of Israel, he's not speaking of Gentile believers, he's speaking of national ethnic Israel. Just a simple exegesis of the text, not importing anything from any other passage into it, just reading these texts here. Well, that leads to the obvious question, has God rejected his people? Is God finished with Israel? Paul says, by no means, and he first explains that there is a remnant of believers like him, in every generation, there is a remnant of believers, just as there was in Elijah's day, 7,000 who didn't bow the knee to Baal. So also there is a remnant of believers here. And he even makes uh, Elijah making appeals to God against Israel in 11.2. Who does he mean by Israel? National, ethnic Israel. Now, verse 7. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. Why am I reading all these passages? Simply to say that Paul is using Israel to speak of ethnic national Israel after making reference to an Israel within Israel, uh, a remnant within the nation. He now uses Israel speaking exclusively about ethnic national Israel. Now notice this, verse 12, if their trespass means riches for the world and their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Have we seen Israel's full inclusion yet? No, of, of course not. And notice what Paul says in verse 11, did they stumble in order they might fall, or fall beyond recovery, the implication? By no means, rather through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. So Paul had every opportunity here to refer to the Gentiles as Israel. He doesn't. He refers to them as Gentiles and says that their role is to make Israel envious, enjoying the covenant blessings, the riches of the Messiah, the forgiveness of sins, and thereby making Israel envious as the Gentiles have what covenantally belonged to them. And just as their turning away has opened the door in God's sovereignty for the Gentiles to be saved, so their turning back will bring something extraordinary on the earth that has not yet happened and to which we are still looking forward. He says this, I'm speaking to you Gentiles inasmuch then as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. So his immediate goal is the salvation of a remnant among the people. His immediate goal is the saving of some of them. He is looking forward to their full inclusion. 
For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. He then gives a warning about Gentile arrogance and obviously the idea that the Gentile church has replaced Israel or that God is finished with Israel. He gives a very strong word of warning. And of course, by not heeding the warning through the years, the church has become arrogant. Supersessionism has come in. And while there are Christians today who hold to replacement theology, who hold to supersessionism, who are absolutely not anti-Semites through history, unfortunately, the idea that God was finished with Israel, the idea that the Jewish people were just accursed to scatter under judgment, the idea that the church had replaced Israel opened the door wide to a horrible history of anti-Semitism, which we still have to undo in witnessing with Jewish people who often associate Jesus with the horrors of much of church history. Paul continues explaining how natural branches can be grafted back into their own tree. And then he says this in verse 25, lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, by which he means something in God's plan of salvation, which has been previously hidden, but is now being revealed. What is the mystery? A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Let's understand a couple of things here. It is a partial hardening because it's not over all the people of Israel. There is a remnant like Paul who believes, or like me as a Jewish believer today, and it's partial in that it is not for all time. The veil will be lifted and there will be a turning. How long will this hardening last until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in? Is there still a hardening on Jewish hearts towards Jesus? Yes, this has not yet come to pass. Has the fullness of the Gentiles come in? In accordance with Revelation 7, for every tribe and tongue and kindred and nation, there remain about 2 billion people in the world today who have never heard the name of Jesus. There remain unreached tribes and tongues. The fullness of the Gentiles has not come in. And if that fullness includes unity and coming to the fullness of the knowledge of God, as Paul speaks of in Ephesians 4, and as Jesus prayed for in John 17, that clearly has not happened yet, or we wouldn't be having a debate about these issues as brothers in the Lord, both earnestly seeking the truth. So this has not yet happened. There remains this hardening over the hearts of Israel. The fullness of the Gentiles has not yet come in. And then Paul says this, and in this way, or so, All Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. Now, let's notice he's not referring to the church here. The church is not Jacob. The church in the New Testament is never referred to as Jacob. Also, when Paul says all Israel, as many exegetes and commentators note, it's impossible that he has a different Israel in mind in verse 26 than he has in verse 25, or in the previous 10 references when he's referred to Israel, which is why I read these texts. He's referring to national ethnic Israel, and he says there will be a national turning. Has it happened yet? No. Has the national mourning that, Paul, uh, that, that Zechariah speaks of in Zechariah 12, 10 to 13, 1, resulting in national cleansing, has that happened yet? Absolutely not. And notice it's at a future time yet when Israel is surrounded by the nations and armies of the world. That has not happened yet. It's looking forward to a future time when the Redeemer himself touches down in Jerusalem, returning, as Acts 1 says, just the way he came back and is laid out in Zechariah 14. That has not yet happened. That coming of the Redeemer that Paul speaks of in 2 Thessalonians 1 where he says it'll come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who don't know God, at which time we will receive relief from persecution. That has not yet happened. The event of Revelation 1-7, when every eye sees him and all the nations of the earth mourn because of him, that has not yet happened. The event that Paul looked forward to in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4, where we will literally be physically resurrected and our bodies will put on immortality, that has not yet happened. If Jesus does not return to this earth in our lifetimes, we will all still physically die. This mortal has not yet put on immortality, which Paul spoke of as yet to come. And we become like Jesus in his risen, glorified form that 1 John speaks of as well. These are things we are yet looking forward to. The last days of which Isaiah spoke. We understand the last days has different meanings in different contexts, but clearly it's not speaking of the end of the Old Covenant period. Rather, it's speaking of the day when there'll be no more war on the earth, when all the nations will come and worship God in Jerusalem. That has not happened. If words have any meaning, those things have not yet happened. When Paul says, in this way all Israel will be saved, he's either speaking in a temporal manner after 
the turning of the Gentiles after the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, or he's speaking in a consequential manner, provoked by the fullness of the Gentiles, provoked to jealousy by the fullness of the Gentiles, all Israel will be saved. This is the hope of the prophets. You can read passages like Jeremiah 31 to 33 or 30 to 33. They begin with promises of the return from exile in Babylon, but many of the things prophesied still did not happen, where God says at that time he'll be the God of all the families of Israel. That did not happen yet, when Israel's salvation will bring the fullness of the glory of God to the world, as Paul spoke of. Even as we look in Isaiah 59, from whence he quotes, we see leading into Isaiah 60, these are things that have not yet happened, if words have any meaning. Passages like Isaiah 11, where the wolf lies down with the lamb, and where there's no more war, and there's universal knowledge of the glory of the, of the Lord under Messiah's reign, these things have not yet happened in this fallen and broken world in which we live. And even Isaiah 27, which Paul also quotes from, as part of the apocalypse of Isaiah, Isaiah 24 to 27, which speak of the end of the age and speak of the final triumph of God and the final destruction of Satan. We have not yet seen that take place on the earth. And this way all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. Paul apparently adding in a quotation from Psalm 14 to Isaiah 59, speaking of deliverance coming from Zion, uh, to, uh, to, the, to the people of Israel, to ethnic Israel, even in exile, even in the land from Zion, from the Messianic Redeemer. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. That has not happened. Those who say that Isaiah, uh, that, uh, that uh, AD 70 is the second coming of Jesus, while I don't downplay the importance of the event, while I don't downplay the importance of the destruction of Jerusalem in Isaiah 70, while I don't downplay the idea that God came in judgment in a certain way there, that is a work of judgment, whereas Paul is speaking of a work of salvation. What he looks for here has not yet happened, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. The new covenant was inaugurated with the remnant. It has not yet gone to the nation as a whole, and it is promised to Israel and Judah in Jeremiah 31. What's fascinating is immediately after the new covenant promises in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34, that Jeremiah then speaking for the Lord makes clear that God is not finished with Israel and says, no matter what they do, they will still be preserved as a people. And we see that we have been scattered around the world under divine discipline and judgment and hated by the nations and still preserved. How did that happen? God keeps his promises. Just like when he brought Israel in the land, the historians, the, the writers said, there's that one promise he made he didn't keep. Well, he didn't just promise to bring them into the land, but to keep them there. And if we were scattered to bring us back, even in disobedience and rebellion, he would bring us back for his namesake, according to Ezekiel 36. What's prophesied there has not fully taken place as well, we can see that the only one that could regather the Jewish people to the land is God. When he blesses, no one can curse. When he curses, no one can bless. When he opens the door, no one can shut it. When he shuts the door, no one can open it. When he scatters, no one can regather. And yet we see that the Jewish people, six million strong, the same numbers were killed in the Holocaust, are living in Israel today, regathered. How did it happen? Was it just statehood, political craftsmanship? Uh, self-will? No, because we were scattered under divine judgment. It is only God who can regather us. We are witnessing God at work in history today in front of our eyes. It's another reason I'm so filled with optimism and hope and expectation and hold to an eschatology of great victory. Now, Paul continues and says this, as regards the gospel, they, who, Israel, all Israel, the nation, the one of whom he has been speaking. It is impossible to exegete this as meaning the church, that all Israel means the church. It's also impossible to exegete it as saying it just means the remnant of all the previous generations. He's talking about a climactic future act. He's talking about a turning from sin among the Jewish people that has not yet happened. And he's talking about it in conjunction with the coming of the Redeemer. As regards the gospel, they, who, the Jewish people, are enemies for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of the forefathers. It has nothing to do with Israel's goodness. It has to do with God keeping his word. It has nothing to do with the ethnic superiority of a group. It has to do with the faithfulness of God. He who started the work will finish it, 
And there are many promises that remain yet for Israel. Read through the prophetic books. Read through Isaiah. Read through Jeremiah. Read through Ezekiel. Read through these many passages. There are so many passages that have not yet come to pass, but they will because God keeps his word. We have not yet seen the renovating of the universe according to 2 Peter 3 and the burning up of the elements with fervent fire and a new heaven and a new earth where there's no more death or sorrow or pain in which righteousness dwell. And, and Peter tells us in Acts 3 that God will keep all the promises he made through the, prom- through the prophets of the restoration of all things. That has not yet happened. And so Paul closes with this, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. As surely as God is God, the one who scattered the Jewish people around the world has brought them back, and he will continue to do so. He will turn our hearts, and there will ultimately be a national turning, not necessarily every single Jewish person, but as the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, there will be a national turning of the Jewish people back to God. So it is written. Demonstrating, of course, that he does have his own radio program. Uh, Dr. Brown finishes within approximately 0.7 of a second of exactly where he <laughs> needed to be. Uh, so I, I congratulate you, uh, Brother Brown, on that. All right, now we have had our 17-minute opening statement from Michael Brown. Once again, for those just now tuning in, let me remind you of the thesis statement. Does Romans 11, 25-27 State that there will be a national turning of the Jewish people to God. Are there any Old Testament or New Testament promises made to ethnic Israel that remain to be fulfilled? Michael Brown has made his case for his perspective, and now Don Preston has 17 minutes to make his case on the very same issue. Dr. Preston, the time is yours. Thank you so much, and thank you, Dr. Brown, for that very eloquent and passionate presentation. There's a great deal, actually, that I agree with that, although... Obviously, the essentials I do not. Uh, I want to, first of all, uh, present my case by saying I agree with Dr. Brown that Rome 11, 25 to 27, is dealing with ethnic Israel. I agree 100% that when he says in verse 28 and 29 that those who are unbelievers refer to ethnic uh, Israel at that time. But I want to build my case based upon uh, an examination of the prophetic background and the prophetic source that Paul appeals to in Romans chapter 11. I believe this is one of the most ignored uh, aspects of our study of Romans chapter 11, 25 to 20, 27. I'll try to incorporate as much as I possibly can. Let me state just very, very quickly here what virtually all scholars acknowledge. Br- uh, Brother Brown has already acknowledged part of it. Paul cites in his prediction of and in his anticipation of the salvation of Israel, he quotes from Isaiah 27, 10 and following, Isaiah 59, Jeremiah 31, and I would also add, although there's not a plethora of scholars who take note of this, but I believe it very obvious, obvious that he's echoing Daniel chapter 9, 24 through 27, and the prediction that 70 weeks are determined to put away sin. Romans chapter 11, the taking away of Israel's sin. So let me develop that by introducing what I consider to be a a hermeneutical schema that is critical to understand. Point number one, Paul is emphatic, not only here, but throughout the entirety of uh, of his writings, that his eschatological hope was nothing but the hope of Israel found in Torah, found in the Old Testament. Paul did not develop a New Testament eschatology divorced from Old Covenant Israel. I believe that's critical to understand. Point number two, Paul says that he, through the Holy Spirit, was giving the divine interpretation. What had once been not understood, i.e. the mystery of God, Dr. Brown has acknowledged that the mystery is something formerly unknown, but now, one of Paul's key words, key contrasts throughout his uh, epistolary corpus is then versus now. And so Paul speaks of the mystery of God, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets. Paul, through the Holy Spirit, was giving the divine interpretation, the inspired interpretation of Old Testament prophets. Point number three, Paul informs us throughout the entirety of his writings, but also the New Te- rest of the New Testament writers as well, that the time foretold by the Old Testament prophets for the restoration of Israel had in fact arrived. I'll try to develop that just a little bit more. With those very, very preliminary uh, hermeneutical principles in place, I want to show and develop at least ever so bri- briefly how I understand the fulfillment of Isaiah 27, 59, Jeremiah 31, and if I have time, how I want, I want to see how Daniel chapter 9 is fulfilled uh, uh, in 
Paul's immediate future. Let's take a look, first of all, at Isaiah chapter 27. Uh, I was glad to hear Dr. Brown allude to Isaiah chapters 24 to 29 as the little apocalypse. Scholars have recognized that for many years. Well, Isaiah chapter 27, uh, and for brevity's sake, I'm, gonna, I'm only going to read a part of it, but I want you to notice what, what Isaiah chapter 27 has to say. Verse 7 and following, has he, that's Yahweh, struck Israel as he has struck those who struck him? Or has he been slain? That is, has Israel been slain according to the slaughter of those who were slain by him? Well, the response is, Yahweh's response is, yes, in measure by sending it away. In other words, he had slain Israel by sending her away. He removes it by his rough wind in the day of the east wind. Now watch very carefully, folks. I hope you have your Bible. Therefore, by this, the iniquity of Jacob will be covered. And this is all the fruit of the taking away of his sin when he takes away all the stones of the altar, like chalk stones that are beaten to dust, wooden images and incense, altars shall not stand, yet the fortified city will be desolate, the habitation forsaken and left like a wilderness. There the calf will feed, there it will lie down and consume its branches. Now watch verse 11, part B. This is a people of no understanding. Who's referring to? O covenant Israel. He's echoing Deuteronomy 32, verse 18, which speaks of and prophesies Israel's last days. Not the last days of time, Israel's last days. Deuteronomy 32, 19 and following. Deuteronomy 32, uh, 30 and following. Now watch. The one who made them will have no mercy on them. He will, he, the one who formed them will show them no favor. Now, here is Yahweh predicting two things. Number one, judgment. Number two, salvation. I believe it's wrong to set up a false dichotomy, a false contrast, if you please, in Romans 11, and to say, well, Paul in Romans 11 is talking about salvation. He's not talking about judgment. In Isaiah chapter 27, we have both judgment and salvation. And as a matter of fact, as N.T. Wright in his book, Victory of uh, God, Paul and the Victory, Jesus and the Victory of God, excuse me, said, that in the Old Testament scriptures, there is a doctrine well hammered out in many passages which speak of Israel's salvation coming through, not from, but coming through judgment. That is precisely what we have in Isaiah chapter 27. This is the fruit of the taking away of their sin when I take away, or when I turn the altar into chalkstone. Now, notice also in the context, the immediate context, Isaiah chapter 26. 21, the Lord himself shall come out of heaven, shall tread on the tops of the mountains, and the earth shall disclose its blood. Here's the vindication of the blood of the martyrs. Now, hang on to that, because that's Deuteronomy 32, 43 as well. So, what do we find in Isaiah 27, one of Paul's pivotal passages for Romans chapter 11? We have the prediction of the salvation of Israel at the time of the judgment of Israel, when the martyr's blood would be vindicated at the coming of the Lord. Passage number two, Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59 breaks itself down very, very beautifully into three headings. Number one, accusation. Number two, acknowledgement. Number three, action. Let me develop those ever so briefly. The accusation is found in verses three through seven, in which Three times Yahweh accuses Israel of having their hands full of innocent blood. Remember Isaiah 26, 21. At the salvation of Israel, the martyr's blood would be vindicated. Point number two, acknowledgement. Israel even acknowledges her sin before Yahweh. Trouble of it is, she doesn't repent of her sin. She says, our sin is ever before us. Our sin mounts up to the heavens, which, by the way, contains within it the seed thought of the filling up of the measure of sin. What's the sin under consideration? Under chief consideration, shedding of the blood of the martyrs. Point number three, the Lord took action. He saw that there was no man. He saw that there was no intercessor. Therefore, the Lord put on uh, the breastplate of righteousness. He put on the garments of vengeance. And notice what he says, verse 16 and following. According to their deeds, accordingly, I will repay vengeance to my adversaries, recompense to my enemies. Here is Yahweh saying that this time under consideration 
of the vindication of the blood of the, of the righteous would be when he came in judgment of the wicked. But notice, it is very next verse, the time of the salvation of Israel. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sin. So once again, we have the coupling of the salvation of Israel, but it's coupled inextricably with the time of the judgment of Israel and specifically the judgment of Israel for shedding innocent blood. Third text, Jeremiah chapter 31. Don't have time to develop this extensively, but let me simply say this. Obviously, uh, Dr. Brown and I agree 100%. This is the promise of the making of the new covenant. I agree 100%. Just as the text says, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Jacob. What needs to be understood is that the Gentiles could be partakers, equal partakers in that covenant. Just like the mixed multitude who came out of Egypt, came before Sinai, and the covenant was made with Israel. But these Gentiles, these pagans, if you please, entered into the benefits of that covenant. Just so it is today. Yahweh made the covenant with both houses of Israel you and I today as Gentiles, Dr. Brown being a Jew, but those of us who are Gentiles are participants, equal participants in that new covenant. But here's what I want to focus on. That new covenant would be the marriage of Yahweh, the remarriage. I must hasten to develop this very, very quickly. Yahweh was married to Israel at Sinai. Jeremiah 31 establishes that. All of the language of Exodus 19 and following is marital language. Now watch this. Israel, the ten northern tribes, committed spiritual adultery. What did God do? He divorced them. Hosea chapter 2, 1 and 2. Write a bill of divorcement. She is not my wife. I am not her husband. And yet Yahweh promised that the days were coming, the last days, in which I will make a new covenant for them with the beasts of the field, and I will betroth them to me again in righteousness. I will betroth them to me forever. But the covenant would be a new, a different kind of a covenant. Watch what Yahweh did when he divorced Israel. Hosea breaks itself down into divorce, departure, and death. When Yahweh divorced Israel, he departed from her, Hosea chapter 5. When he departed from her, he killed her, and we find that in, in uh, Isaiah uh, and Jeremiah in the text that we've already seen. But God promised that the time was coming in which he would betroth Israel to himself again, in which he would return to her, Hosea chapter 6, he will return to us, he will come to us, he will raise us up, we will live in his presence. There's a resurrection. But here's what I want us to see. This is critical. Although Yahweh divorced the ten northern tribes, he could not divorce Judah. Why? Messiah had not come. But Yahweh did promise in Hosea chapter 6, 7 and following, that although Israel had sinned like Adam in transgressing the covenant, and even though Judah was worse, she had her own harvest coming. That harvest would be at the time of the salvation of the remnant. Now, here's what I want us to see also. When Yahweh destroyed and killed Old Covenant Israel, the ten northern tribes, he said, the virgin daughter of Israel is fallen and will never rise again. That's pretty emphatic language. Five now, minutes. Note, thank you. Notice in, in Amos chapter 9, verse 8, the eyes of the Lord are on the wicked kingdom, for I will destroy it from the face of the earth, but I will not forsake the family. Notice the contrast. I will destroy the kingdom of Israel, not the family of David. What God was going to do was in the last days when Messiah came, when the scepter departed from Judah, Genesis 49 verse 10, he would divorce Judah in exactly the same way he divorced Israel. How did he divorce Israel? He destroyed the kingdom of Israel, Hosea chapter 1, verse 5. The New Testament is replete with the language of the impending divorce of Judah. What did Jesus say in Matthew 22? The invitation to the wedding was sent out. All things are ready, come to the feast. Those who are invited, 
rebuffed the servants. They killed them. The master of the wedding sent out his armies. He killed those wicked men and burnt their city with fire. That's Jerusalem. That's the divorcement of Judah. So God was going to destroy, slay the old covenant kingdom, the nationalistic kingdom of Israel, but he was going to remarry Israel. Old covenant Israel was going to be reborn. As Isaiah 63 said, as John chapter 3, speaking in the plural, you, second person plural, you must all be born again. Israel was to be born, remade, recreated, if you please, from the mortal body of, of the covenant of death, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, transformed into the new covenant of life. And so Revelation depicts for us the destruction of the city, quote, Babylon, which is where the Lord was slain. And immediately the paean of victory is sung, let us rejoice for the time of the wedding has come. Whose wedding is this? This is the wedding of all 12 tribes of Revelation chapter 7, Revelation chapter 14. This is the righteous remnant. They are joining with the un the innumerable multitude of Gentiles who are now going to come into the blessings of Israel's new covenant, Israel reborn into the new covenant body of Jesus Christ. So what does that mean in Romans chapter 11? I could fully concur in Romans chapter 11 that Paul is dealing with the climax of Israel's covenant history. The climax of Israel's covenant history was to be when Israel would be judged for shedding innocent blood. What did Jesus say about when the innocent blood would be avenged? All of the righteous blood of all the righteous from Abel unto Zacharias, son of Berechias, would be avenged in his generation in the judgment of Israel. Two minutes. Now, unless, unless we can create an avenging of the blood of the martyrs, dichotomized from Isaiah, dichotomized from Isaiah 59, then Matthew 23 gives us the context for the fulfillment of Romans chapter 11. When was the new covenant going to be made? Y Yahweh's covenant with Judah was nigh unto passing, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 13. But the new covenant was almost complete. The bride, the new Jerusalem, was about to be revealed, come down from God out of heaven, and all nations, all nations now invited into the new heaven and the new earth, which is the body of Christ. I'm going to give up about 16 seconds there. A lot more I could say, but I'll leave it at that. Uh, actually, you, you had an, a minute and 12 seconds. Uh, if, if you I'll want. take it. Okay, okay. You, you've still got, you still, <laughs> still got a minute. Go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Daniel chapter 9, 70 weeks are determined on your people and on your city to put away sin. I do not believe there's any way to get the consummation of the 70th week beyond the, beyond the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Christ came to put away sin, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 26. The consummation of that process of putting away sin would be his appearing out of the most holy place to bring salvation. And the writer of Hebrews chapter 10 verse 37 says, now in a very, very little while, Hosan Hosan Mikron is the Greek, the one who is coming. Well, who is coming? Hebrews 9, 28. He shall appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. He would do that to fulfill the typological significance of the Day of Atonement. And the writer said it was very, very near, just like Romans said, our salvation, Israel's salvation, was had drawn near. I think that's enough. Thank you. All right. Thank you very, very much for your presentation, sir. And uh, just to remind everyone, we are listening to a debate between Don Preston and Michael Brown. The thesis statement, does Romans 11, 25 through 27 state that there will be a national turning of the Jewish people to God? Are there any Old Testament or New Testament promises made to ethnic Israel that remain to be fulfilled? We have had both 17-minute opening statements. We now have the 12-minute rebuttal sections where each debater will respond to the specific claims and arguments made by the other. We will begin with Dr. Brown. Dr. Brown, you have 12 minutes, sir. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Preston, thank you. That was terrific, lucid, eloquent, clearly thought out. I am thrilled that you went back to the Old Testament text for Paul's background because those actually completely refute and undermine your position when we look at them more broadly. Moreover, there's not a syllable that you said that undermined my exegesis of Romans 9, 10, and 11, and the fact that you agree 
that the verses refer to ethnic Israel. Wonderful. And that sense, slam dunk. So let's, <laughs> let's break these things down. First, to reiterate, we have not yet seen what Paul spoke of in Romans 11. There still is hardening on Jewish people towards the gospel. That hasn't changed. The fullness of the Gentiles has still not come in. We're still reaching out and bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth. The life from the dead that Paul spoke of in Romans 11 earlier, that has still not taken place. And yes, judgment came in a severe way in in AD 70, and Jesus wept over it in Luke 19 and prophesied it in Matthew 23 and elsewhere. It was devastating, and the consequences remain. The temple has still not been rebuilt all these millennia later. Terrible judgment came, but let's remember that that was not the end of the story. As Jesus says in Matthew 23, 39, to the Jewish leadership, you will not see me again. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jewish leadership, you will not see me again until you say, Baruch haba b'shem and I, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, you will not see me again until you welcome me back. There is that welcoming back. Luke 21, Jerusalem, trodden underfoot by the Gentiles, Jewish people scattered until the time of the fullness of the Gentiles. So again, what Paul lays out in Romans 11 has not yet happened. Regarding the divorce issue, let's remember that the same prophets, prophets like Hosea and Jeremiah, who spoke of Israel's divorce and Judah's divorce, also spoke of a remarriage. And the very prophet Hosea that spoke all the destructive and terrible words about northern Israel spoke of the restoration of the northern tribes as well. At the end of his book, just read Hosea 14 and the promises to Israel, meaning national Israel, meaning even specifically the northern tribes that are there. Even after the divorce in Jeremiah, the third chapter, the fourth chapter, God continues to call the northern tribes back because he said, I will espouse you yet again. When we look at the context of the passages like Isaiah 24 to 27, from which Paul draws, yes, the little apocalypse, the apocalypse of Isaiah, of course what's prophesied there has not yet happened in full. Atonement has been made, but it has not yet been received. And I'm fine with the 70 weeks ending uh, right there with the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, because that has to do with atonement being made. It has been made. It has not yet been received, which is what Paul agonized over, and which is why he was so emphatic that the promises yet remain. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. He didn't know anything about a permanent and a forever divorce. He didn't know anything about that. He knew about the irrevocable promises of God. He knew going back to Abraham in Genesis 15 that God made a one-way covenant. Only God passed between the covenantal pieces. And as Paul reminds us in Galatians 3, the law, which is 430 years after, cannot annul the promise that God gave. We're talking about God's sovereignty and God keeping his word. So as we look at Isaiah 24, 27, 24th chapter speaks of the shaking of the whole world beyond anything we have seen thus far. If words have any meaning, we have not yet seen what Isaiah 24 speaks of. When we get to the 25th chapter, it speaks of the absolute and final abolition of death. The fact that millions of people will die around the world this week means we have not yet seen the final abolition of death, the thing that Paul was looking forward to, this mortal body putting on immortality. If words have any meaning, we have to admit these things have not yet happened. Even Isaiah 27, which speaks as the final and ultimate destruction of the evil one, 1 Peter 5 tells us he's still going about as a roaring lion, seeking we may devour. His power has been broken, but his final ultimate defeat, where he can do no damage anymore on the earth, that has not yet happened. And let's remember once again Peter in Acts 3 says that Jesus will remain in heaven until the time for the restoration of all things spoken by the prophets. And as Isaiah 2 described the last days, it'll come to pass in the last days, the end of days, which again has to do with the vantage point of the author, what he's looking forward to, what is at the end of his horizon. What does Isaiah speak of? He speaks of the mountain of the Lord's house in Jerusalem being exalted and all nations streaming into it, and people beating their swords into plowshares, and people no longer making war with one another, just as Isaiah 11 speaks of. This simply has not happened. 
no matter what construction you put on it. And, and since I'm thrilled that Dr. Preston emphasized that Paul's eschatological hope is related to Israel's eschatological hope, we, we know what Israel was looking forward to based on the Hebrew scriptures and based on what Jewish literature also tells us. The idea that the last days just meant the last days of Israel, that covenant is really something very foreign to the biblical text and foreign even to Jewish eschatological thought. Uh, when we go to Isaiah 59, we see that that has not yet been realized. What is spoken of continues into the 60th chapter, where Israel rises and shines. It continues into the 62nd chapter, where Jerusalem becomes the praise of all the earth. Just read those chapters and ask very simply, Isaiah 2, 1 through 4, Isaiah 11, Isaiah 25, Isaiah 59, into the 60th chapter and beyond. Have those fully come to pass yet? The answer is certainly no, if words have any meaning. Uh, let's, let's also look at this idea of judgment being tied in with salvation. Yes, many times those things go hand in hand. God says, for example, in Isaiah 30 or Isaiah 19, that there would be smiting and then healing. We know that that's the case, but we also know that, that Paul is grieving over Israel's broken state, separated from God as a nation, in Romans 9, 10, and 11, and he's longing for the day when Israel will turn and be saved. He's not longing for the day of the destruction of Jerusalem. He's not longing for the day of God judging Israel for the blood of the martyrs and even the blood of the Messiah. He's looking for Forward to the day when there'll be national repentance and turning. Has it happened yet? Obviously not. The fact that we as Jewish believers make up one or two percent of our people across the world means that the partial hardening has remained. I've still not heard a syllable that addresses how Paul, what Paul writes of in Romans 11 has actually come to pass and why he reminds us that those who are enemies then will no longer be enemies. The religious Jews still remain enemies of the gospel, feeling they're doing God's will. That remains the same. Again, we're still evangelizing around the world. The fullness of the Gentiles has not yet come in. We're still in the midst of doctrinal disputes and division. Obviously, fullness has not come in. Again, the image of the full knowledge of the Son of God, Ephesians 4. We are still working and laboring towards these things. Uh, not only so, but when we look at Jeremiah 31, and let me step back and give a principle. And I had to work this through when working on my Jeremiah commentary. I saw that there were many promises that Jeremiah spoke that happened with immediacy. That, yes, there, there was a judgment. The temple was destroyed. Jerusalem was burned. Uh, the, the Jewish people were scattered in exile into Babylon. And then he said there'd be a return after 70 years. And there was 70 years after the earliest captives, which uh, included Daniel. There was a return of the exiles and the captives, but not at the level he spoke of, not at the level Isaiah prophesied, not at the level Ezekiel prophesied. It was what you would call already and not yet. It was a partial fulfillment, what others would refer to as realized eschatology. There was a return, but not with the glory expected. The temple was rebuilt, but not with the expected glory. And in fact, Israel was supposed to turn back to God with one heart and one soul, both Judah and Israel united. Ezekiel prophesied that as well, to the point that the nations would see the glory of God and be drawn in. That has not happened as fully as was expected. So what do we understand? We understand that there was an application in the 6th century BC, and there was a final application. There was a partial application also in the 1st century with the coming of the Messiah and the establishing of the New Covenant. But when you read the rest of it, we see that there's a point where Jerusalem will never be destroyed again at the end of Jeremiah 31. Has that happened yet? Absolutely not. Have all the glorious healings and deliverances and redemptions on a national level that were prophesied of in the 33rd chapter, have those happened? Only in part. That's exactly where we are today. And I, I want to draw everyone back to the plain and simple and clear exegesis of Romans 9, 10, and 11. Again, much respect to Dr. Preston for thinking these issues through, for going back to the Old Testament text. But having looked at those texts and seeing that in no way do they undermine my position, rather they support it looking forward to the fulfillment of all of the words of the prophets, the fulfillment of the words of the New Testament, 
that have not yet happened. That is all part of Israel's eschatological hope, the renewal of the world, to call the church the new heavens and the new earth and to say there's no more war and we have already put on immortality and the Lord has returned in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those that don't know God and that persecution has ceased and so on. Is, is We might as well not even speak the English language or use Hebrew and Greek because words no longer have meaning. And if we'll simply carefully exegete the text Romans 9, 10, and 11, and continue on with the greater hope that Paul is looking forward to expressed in Romans 15 and 16, and the hope of the Lord's appearing, his visible appearing that he was looking forward to, at which point we would receive our reward, at which point we would be resurrected and become like him. What we'll be like, 1 John 3, we don't yet know, but when he appears, we will be like him. All that Paul is longing for is the expression of the prophets, the expression of that day when all Israel will be saved. And and my hope is that those who are listening to this debate will recognize that it remains imperative that we get Paul's heart for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, that we carry his burden as well, that we too carry a burden to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth, number one, out of love for God, number two, out of love for the people of the nations, and number three, to hasten the redemption of Israel. And that's what Peter writes in 2 Peter 3, with the hope that we have, we live with a certain urgency to hasten that day of the coming of God in which the elements will burn up with fervent heat, in which the Lord will establish a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells, and to reiterate where the wolf lies down with the lamb where the lion eats ox like the straw, where there's no more war, there's universal knowledge of God. That's the hope of the prophets. That's the hope of Paul. That will happen when the Messiah returns, which is why I long for it and wait with it with such expectation. And having finished, I will yield my final three seconds. (laughs) Seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know why I'm bothering to keep time. Uh, <clears throat> but um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Brown. Uh, that was uh, Dr. Michael Brown's 12 minute rebuttal. And now we move over uh, to Dr. Preston. You have 12 minutes for your rebuttal, sir. You may begin. Thank you so much. And thank you again, Dr. Brown. I appreciate your fervor very, very much. Uh, You said that virtually nothing I said uh, rebutted what you said. Well, obviously, I believe everything I said rebuts everything that you say. (laughs) So (laughs) we're we're engaged in a wonderful conversation here, and I appreciate your gracious attitude, by the way. Uh, let, Let me address something that you've said several times here. You have said, if words have any meaning whatsoever, then the language of Isaiah chapter 24 and the shaking of heaven and earth has not happened. If words have any meaning whatsoever, then uh, Isaiah's prediction, they shall beat their swords into plowshares, etc. If words have any meaning whatsoever, then this hasn't happened. At the very beginning of my uh, first presentation, I introduced a hermeneutical principle that I think is absolutely critical, as I stated then. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, as he anticipated the parousia of Christ to bring salvation to the soul. And he said, of of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently concerning the time and the manner of the things of which they spoke, to whom it was revealed that not to themselves did they minister the things of which they spoke, but unto us. Now, pardon me, I also made it abundantly clear, citing several passages that Paul says over and over and over, that Paul was revealing the true meaning of the Old Testament prophecies. Now, if we are to take the position, well, if words have any meaning whatsoever, then surely the Old Testament prophets understood what a temple was. They understood what a land was. They understood what an altar and a a sacrifice was when they predicted the coming of a Messianic temple. But the New Testament writers, Peter's very emphatic. They did not understand either the time or the manner. Now, let me illustrate this, if I might. Peter, whose eschatology was nothing but the hope of Israel found in the Old Testament, and I want to address two texts, even if I don't get to much else of what Dr. Brown has addressed. Peter addresses the diaspora. Who are the diaspora? Well, I don't have to tell Dr. Brown or anyone else. Diaspora is the technical first century word for the the tribes of Israel scattered abroad. 
Peter is addressing them. But they're not simply the diaspora. They are believers in Jesus Christ who have now been redeemed, not by corruptible things such as gold and silver, from their vain conversation received by tradition from the fathers, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Here he is bringing about the second Exodus motif. Israel was redeemed by the blood of the Passover lamb. Now this new Israel, if you please, is being redeemed by the precious blood of Christ as the true Passover, which is replacing the old Passover. Now, I want you to notice in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and following, you therefore as living stones are being built up a spiritual house to offer up spiritual sacrifice. What are they? They're a spiritual priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices, wholly acceptable unto God. Now I want to go back to Hosea chapter 3 very quickly. In Hosea chapter 3, 4 and following, Yahweh said, just like Hosea had to put away his wife and be without her for many, many days, Yahweh said, Israel shall be without temple, altar, priesthood, sacrifices, or ephod until the last days when David their king comes and will rule over them. That's obviously a paraphrase. So here is Yahweh having divorced the 10 northern tribes and says they would be without temple, altar, priesthood, sacrifice, or ephod. But here's Peter writing to the diaspora, 10 northern tribes, and saying they had become a spiritual priesthood in a spiritual temple that is made of living stones built upon the spiritual living foundation of Jesus Christ. He quotes Psalms 118. He quotes Isaiah 28. He quotes Isaiah chapter 811. The predictions of the building of the Messianic temple and the chief cornerstone there, he interprets those Old Testament prophecies of the Messianic temple but Christ is the living stone. Those first century saints were the living stones. They were now a spiritual priesthood. They were offering up spiritual sacrifices. And I want you to notice what's really powerful to me about this. Hosea said that Israel would be without the ephod. That ephod obviously was the means by which God communicated to them, the means of spiritual interpretation, or I should say the means of spiritual revelation to Israel. Israel would be devoid of the Spirit. I don't have to tell Dr. Brown, I'm sure, of how the Jews believed and acknowledged. It can be verified in a great number of sources that Israel believed that Israel had been without the spirit from Malachi onward. Now, did some of the Hasmoneans claim to have a prophetic spirit? Yeah, in some sort of way. That's not the point. They believed that the prophetic spirit uh, uh, spirit as poured out on the Old Testament prophets had abandoned Israel and would not return until the last days as foretold by Joel 2, 28 and following. Now, look what Peter's doing. Peter says... Those Old Testament prophets foretold the last days. When was Peter living? In what he said, these last days. In the last days, David, the king, would come. Had Jesus come? Had he been exalted to the right hand in fulfillment of Psalms 110? Set it my right hand until I make that make thy enemies thy footstool? Well, 32 times in the New Testament, the New Testament writers quote that verse as fulfilled in Jesus Christ in his ascension and his enthronement at the right hand. And what does Peter go on to say? Those Old Testament prophets knew that what they were predicting was not for themselves, but he says, but for us to whom the Holy Spirit was revealed and revealing, revealing what? The time and the manner of the fulfillment of those Old Testament prophets. Now, if Peter says the Old Testament prophets did not understand either the time or the manner of the fulfillment of their prophecies, and if Peter says those Old Testament prophets foretold, quote, of these days, unquote, Acts 3.23, the days in which he was living. And if Peter says that he and the other apostles had received the Holy Spirit as promised in the Old Covenant. Five minutes. In in Joel. And that if Peter 
was revealing the true meaning of Hosea, and he gives us every constituent element of Hosea chapter 3, 4 and following. And if he's giving us the divine, infallible, spirit-filled interpretation of those things, and it is a spiritual interpretation, then I suggest that it's rather disingenuous. This is no slam whatsoever. This is in kindness. But I suggest it's nonetheless disingenuous to say, well, Peter's kind of using accommodative language. He just uh, sort of kind of applying it. No, he's not. He's giving us through the Holy Spirit the divine interpretation of what Hosea said. Now, let me go back to Acts chapter 2, but first of all, let me go to Acts chapter 1. I'm going to have to hurry here. The disciples asked, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons, but go into the city, and there you will be endued with power from on high. What's he talking about? He's talking about the promise of John in which the Holy Spirit would be poured out. This is the promise of Joel, chapter 2, 28 and following. Why would the promise of Joel or... Why would the Holy Spirit be poured out, as Joel predicted, for the salvation of the remnant? To establish the kingdom and to open the doors of salvation for all men. On the day of Pentecost, the, the day of Pentecost was fully come. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind filled all the house where they were sitting. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. They were accused of being drunken. Peter responded, men and brethren. These are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it's about the third hour of the day, but this is that. He didn't say this is sort of kind of like it will one day be. He didn't say that this, will, this is a foreshadowing of what one day will be. He said this is that. Now, wait a minute. The disciples asked about the time for the establishment of the kingdom. Jesus said, go into the city and wait until you receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was to be poured out to establish the kingdom, to raise Israel from the dead. Ezekiel 37, 12 and following. Ezekiel 36, 25 and following. And here is Peter saying, the Holy Spirit in fulfillment of Joel is being poured out. And he urged them, save yourselves from this untoward generation. So what do we do? We have Peter, through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, giving the true application of Joel, giving the true application of Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel 36. We have Peter applying those prophecies to his day and at that time. Very, very quickly, let me run to Acts chapter 3. Peter did anticipate the restoration of all things that were foretold by all of the prophets, yea, Moses and all of the prophets. Now notice what he said foretold these days. He didn't say days far off. He said these days. Two and minutes. Said, Two minutes. They, they anticipated the arrival of the restoration of all things. The Greek word is apokatastasis. The apokatastasis, the restoration of all things, would be when Christ returned. Notice Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 says the old covenant cultus with his festivals, feast days, Sabbaths, etc., was imposed until the time of Reformation. The Greek word diorthosis is found there, and in all of the lexicons that define them at all, they are synonyms. Diorthosis, apokatastasis are synonyms. Now watch. The Old Covenant, Torah, would be imposed until the time of Reformation. The time of Reformation is when men could enter into the most holy place at the parousia of Christ, the time of salvation, Hebrews 9.28. But the time of the apocatastasis of Acts chapter 3 is the time of the deorthosis. The deorthosis is a time, the end of Torah, the law of Moses. Now, unless we're willing to say that the law of Moses remains valid today, which would be inclusive of circumcision, animal sacrifices, the entire cultus of Old Covenant Israel, then we've got to say that the Old Covenant passed away. But the time of the passing of the Old Covenant cultus was the time of the Re Reformation. The time of the Reformation was the time of the apocatastasis. This places and confirms that Peter's statement that all of those prophets spoke of these days were, in fact, the first century generation. And I would call attention to the fact, Paul said, speaking of the salvation of Romans chapter 13, it is high time to wake out of sleep, knowing the hour, the night is far spent, the day is at hand, the day literally has drawn near. What day? The day of salvation of Israel of Romans chapter 11. Paul was not anticipating a far distant salvation of Israel. 
Thank you very much. Uh, both gentlemen uh, doing excellent jobs with the time here. We now enter into uh, hopefully the section where I will not have to become uh, overly active, but I will if need be. Uh, this is the cross-examination period. And so what we're going to do in the first 15 minutes is Michael Brown will be asking questions of Don Preston. And once again, explaining how this works, we ask questions. Obviously, they can be somewhat leading questions, uh, but uh, these are not arguments. We do not bring up new information. Uh, we do not rebut what was just said and then ask a question. Uh, these, This is the cross-examination period. We're just asking questions. Uh, Michael will be asking the questions for the first 15 minutes, and then we'll switch. And during the second period, then uh, Don Preston will be asking Michael uh, those same questions for 15 minutes. Then we have five-minute closing statements. So uh, with that, I invite uh, Michael to begin his cross-examination of Don. All right. Just to be clear on this, I understand the larger point you're making. Please explain how all Israel was saved in AD 70, and how there is no longer hardening on Israel today? Great question. I appreciate that very much. I believe that we have to take the entirety of Paul's discussion in Romans chapter 9, as you've suggested earlier, uh, into the full consideration. And I think we need to understand one fundamental fact. God never promised to save the entirety of Israel. From the beginning of God's dealings with mankind, God had always and ever only saved a remnant. In Romans chapter 9, Paul gives a couple of citations. He quotes Hosea. He quotes Isaiah chapter 10. Even though the Israel should be as the sand of the sea, yet only a remnant shall be saved. Amos chapter 5, the virgin daughter of Israel has fallen and will never rise again, but the city that went out a thousand shall return a hundred. The city that went out a hundred shall return a ten. Throughout the entirety of the Old Testament, it does not matter what book. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 5 to 7. It shall be the salvation of a remnant. Remnant when? In the days of the making of the new covenant, of the marriage, by the way. Now, I want to put back another point right here. Citing Isaiah chapter 10, uh, verse 20 and following, Paul, as he discusses the fact that the remnant was, at the very time that he wrote, being brought into what? The body of Christ. They were being transformed from the old covenant body to the new covenant. And Paul, in posing the question, has God cast off his, his people Israel? Well, heaven forbid, or God forbid, I am a Benjamin. Paul is asserting that he was of the physical lineage, but he was no longer putting his emphasis on the physical lineage. He was putting his emphasis on the fact that he is a part of, yes, granted that physical lineage, had accepted Messiah through faith, and thus he could say the remnant was being saved. And by the way, he went ahead to say in Romans 9, 28, I believe, to jump ahead just slightly, I believe that the all Israel is in fact the consummation of the process of bringing the full number of the remnant of Old Covenant Israel into the consummated body of Old Covenant Israel's covenant history. I believe that what that's what Isaiah 24, Isaiah 27, or 26 and 27 through 29 are discussing, that Old, old Israel's Old Covenant history was supposed to pass away. I think David Nanos expressed it well in his book, The Mystery of Romans, when he said, Old Covenant Israel, even in Torah and in the Tanakh, contained within itself the promises of the end of Old Covenant Israel's history, the transformation into the body of Christ. What did Paul uh, say? Oh, okay. You know, just out of curiosity, if if the uh, if the format is for me to ask a short question, have a two or three or five minute answer, that's fine. <laughs> I, I, had, I, had a buzz, I mean, I, I'm happy to do the same one. So, Dr. White, just tell us yeah, how go, to proceed. Go ahead and break in if you feel uh, that, that it's going long, but obviously yeah, that was I, a big question. So, oh, Okay, yeah, so so explain, explain then what I'm missing is Paul makes clear that that Israel will no longer be hard, that Israel that is hard will no longer be hard. Are you saying that the nation of Israel is no longer under divine hardening? Let me answer that question specifically and directly and then get back to answering the question, if I may. Uh, obviously, the, the bulk of Israel today is hardened. I do not believe that is an ongoing uh, prophetic reality, however. I believe that Paul is dealing with, number one, Israel's last days, as he tells us. The consummation of the ages has come upon us. He was living in the last days. He was living in the days foretold by Deuteronomy chapter 32. Remember, 
Deuteronomy 32, 19 and following, the Lord says, oh, that they would consider their last end. Oh, that they would understand what their last end shall be. Well, what would in Israel's last days, and this I think will answer something that was said earlier, in Israel's last days, Yahweh said, I will provoke them to jealousy with a people that is not a people. What's Paul saying he's do- he was doing in his personal ministry, Romans 10 11, provoking Israel to jealousy by the calling of the Gentiles, by calling, uh, Brother Brown, I think you expressed it uh, in, in one, one way when you said uh, that the Gentiles were participating in the covenantal blessings of Israel. Well, I agree with that 100%. And so Paul, in fulfillment of Deuteronomy 32, was making Israel in her last days jealous. I would also point out that he— Has has the church made Israel jealous in your understanding? I believe in Israel's last days in the first century. I believe there was, as a matter of fact, we may not even have the chronicling of it, for instance, in Josephus, who wasn't concerned about the church, but we, we may not even have the specific history of it. But I, I believe that Paul believed, and I believe that it took place, that there was a conversion of the rest of the remnant. The first fruit was in the process of being gathered, James chapter 1, verse 18, as he speaks of the 12 tribes of Israel. He has begotten us to be a kind of first fruits. First fruits of what? The end gathering of the remnant, which was for the last days. Now, let me go back to Romans 9, 28. In speaking of the, of the salvation of the remnant, Paul quotes Isaiah and applies it to his days and says, a short work will he make on the earth. He won't make a long work. So how, however framework or however we wish to define, quote, all Israel, Paul's concept of the salvation of Israel has to be confined to a short framework. He uses the Greek word syntoleo, and it does not mean protracted. It means a shortened period of time. I would refer to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, where Paul likewise says the time has been shortened. So Paul believed that the salvation of the remnant, which was ongoing in his day and even in his ministry, being aided by his ministry to the Gentiles was going to be consummated in a very short period of time. Look at what he said. All right. So, so then uh, just, just to be clear then, since you're speaking of the eschaton here, uh, you are saying that we have already put on immortality physically, according to first Corinthians 15, and that according to second Thessalonians one, that Jesus has already come in flaming fire and that there is an end to persecution and relief for us. That has already happened as well. Okay, let me address point number one of putting on immortality. I believe that the discussion that Paul makes, and we could have another debate on this if you wish. (laughs) I believe that Paul's discussion in 1 Corinthians 15 has to do with the Gentiles who were denying Israel's role in her own salvation. The dead ones were being denied resurrection life. Christian dead were not being denied resurrection life. Paul is not dealing with biologically dead uh, corpses coming out of the grave. He is dealing with the fulfillment of Hosea and Isaiah. And again, I'll leave it at that, but I'll simply say that Christ brought life and immortality to light to the go- uh, it, through the gospel, not simply in promise. Brought, he brought life and immortality to light, which means to say, obviously, that he had brought it to us. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. I've written a book entitled In Flaming Fire. Be glad to send you one, Dr. Brown. Uh, Paul is writing to the first century church. He is saying to those of you who are being troubled, he uses the present participial form of thalipsis. I understand that the present participle does does not necessarily demand temporality, but it can indicate that. But he most assuredly uses the present active indicative of Pasco. And he says, to you who are being troubled, thalipsis, rest, Greek word onesis. He uses... Thalipsis and Onesis together, any time in both non-biblical literature as well as biblical literature, any time Onesis and Thalipsis are used as companion words, Onesis is relief from whatever pressure is under consideration. I, I'm not aware of an ex- example or an exception to that rule. I've per- looked at this extensively. Again, there may be an exception, but an exception doesn't destroy a rule. So, Philipsis was persecution for the cause of Christ. The Thessalonians, notice what Paul is saying. He's writing to the church at Thessalonica, and he says, you are being troubled. And he says, it is a righteous thing with God to give 
or to repay with tribulation those who are troubling you. So the question, therefore, would be, who was it when Paul wrote who was persecuting the church at Thessalonica who would be given tribulation at the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ in flaming fire? Now, Paul is very emphatic. He, to you who are being troubled, rest, Onesis, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven. Paul didn't say the Thessalonians would die, go to Abraham's bosom, and receive relief there. He did not say that some providential, you know, uh, non-divine fiat act would take place. He said, relief for whom? For the Thessalonians. Tribulation for whom? To those who are troubling you. Now, we know it wasn't the Romans. All right. Uh, I I won't again, respond, uh, fascinating answers, obviously, uh, with which I differ. Uh, and please send me the book. Okay. Isaiah 2, last day's passage, Isaiah 2, 4, he will judge between the nations, shall decide uh, disputes for any peoples. They'll beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So the last question, these uh, pictures here of no war on the earth and even of the Jewish people scattered no more, uh, never scattered from their land again, uh, how do you say that these things have already taken place with war everywhere and with Jewish people still scattered? Great question. I believe that the reference to they shall beat their swords into plowshares is a direct contrast in covenantal and the nature of the covenants. Old covenant Israel was expanded and defended by the sword. They had to beat their plowshares into swords from time to time in order to defend the kingdom. We find that throughout the entirety of the book of Judges and Kings and what have you. The very nature of Israel's old covenant kingdom was one of warfare and one of the sword. But Jesus was predicting a new covenant kingdom that would not be defended, would not be spread by warfare. Thus, they shall not make war anymore. Now, let me make a further observation of Isaiah chapter 2 and extending into Isaiah chapter 11, which you've alluded to, obviously, uh, of the lamb lying down with the wolf and et cetera, et cetera. Well, it says, in that day... An ensign shall be raised, and to it shall the Gentiles call. Paul quotes that verse in Romans chapter 15, 10 and following, and applies it to his time, his generation, and the calling of the Gentiles to Jesus, who obviously had been raised up. So Paul applies these verses. One more point back on Isaiah. Isaiah chapters 2 through 4 is one harmonious uh, prophecy. Notice in Isaiah chapter 4, that it concludes with the time in which Yahweh would cleanse the blood guilt of the daughters of Zion through the spirit of judgment and fire. And he said, I will spread a canopy over them. That's marital language. So here's the remarriage of Israel that I've alluded to earlier. And he says, this would be the time in which he purged Israel's blood guilt by the spirit of fire and judgment. Here's what's fascinating. Jesus applied Isaiah 2, 9 through 10, Isaiah 2, 19 and 21, to his coming in judgment of Israel in AD 70 in Luke 23, 28 to 31, when he said, as he's led out to his death, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, weep for yourselves and for your children. For, For the time is coming in which they will run to the hills and they will say to the rocks, fall on us. He is citing Isaiah chapter 2, 19 and following, and obviously the parallel of Hosea 8, 10 and following. Okay. All right. Uh, I, actually, I think I have time for one yes. more question. Sure. Uh, since uh, we would agree on prophetic scripture, I believe we would, that, that the Jewish people were scattered in divine judgment, uh, who is it that has regathered them based on my principle that if God scatters, no one can regather? How have we been regathered back to the land six million strong with many other prophetic passages seemingly being fulfilled along with those? Can I have three days to answer that, please? (laughs) Let let me do this as succinctly as possible. Jesus, on the night in which he took the Passover, established himself as the Passover. He likewise, in other passages, uh, defined himself as the new Moses. Jesus 
established himself as leading the second exodus, which Isaiah chapter 11 foretold. In Isaiah chapter 11, I will set my hand again a second time uh, to gather them out of Egypt, Pathros, Cush, et cetera, et cetera. How did Jesus, now this gets back to my hermeneutical principle that I think is very, very key of how the New Testament writers, how Jesus himself interpreted those Old Testament prophecies. If Jesus established himself as the new Passover, if Jesus established himself as the new Moses, if Jesus therefore, or was Jesus therefore not saying, I am gathering the new Exodus, or we are in the second Exodus. In Luke, or excuse me, Matthew 23, 37, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you together as a mother hen gathers her chicks. You would not. What kind of gathering was Jesus concerned with? It wasn't a socioeconomic, geopolitical type of gathering. He wanted a covenantal gathering. And on that very note, by the way, Matthew 23, 39, to go back to a specific question that you had asked. Okay, unfortunately, not going to be able to get there. Not, that not is our going to go there, <laughs> that's okay. Our, <laughs> that's our 15 minutes uh, with uh, Michael Brown asking questions. Now we will ask uh, Don Preston to ask questions of Michael Brown. 15 minutes, and uh, your time begins, sir. All right, very good. Uh, Brother Brown, Peter said that the Old Testament prophets did not know either the time or the manner of the things which they foretold. Therefore, when Peter, Paul, James, and John quote from, cite, and allude to, to use Richard Hayes's language, when they echo the scriptures, the old covenant scriptures, which on a cursory reading, to be sure, sound literalistic. I mean, they talk about the land, the temple, the sacrifice. But when the New Testament writers quote those verses, and they apply them spiritually, upon what basis do we either reject, discount, set aside, or in some way mitigate that spiritual application and look for another physical interpretation or application? Yeah, I, I love the question. I, I love the thinking behind it. Absolutely. First, there's a very simple principle. If a later interpretation makes void the words, the plain sense of the earlier interpretation or the earlier sense, then that has to disqualify it. Otherwise, someone could come along now and say, I am Jesus, and I have a new interpretation, and make void the New Testament. We say that's impossible. I recognize that the timing, exactly how things would unfold, was not clear to the prophets. But you cannot, therefore, now take their words and completely twist their meaning. So, for example, Deuteronomy 13, God laid out a principle for Israel, that if anyone comes and claims to be a prophet or miracle worker, and they work miracles or their words come to pass, and they say, now deviate from the words of the law, worship other gods, then that person is to be stoned to death. They are a false prophet. If the prophet's words could not be literally tested, if God could literally say that no matter what Israel did, he would still preserve Israel as a nation, if he literally said that he had promised the land to them for all generations and would bring them back to the land in disobedience and there restore them spiritually, if those words can be undermined, then we have to question those who came afterwards. Otherwise, as I say, someone could come after the New Testament and say, here's the new revelation, or Muhammad could say that the, the, the New Testament and the Old Testament have things wrong. The other principle is we have to see exactly how things are being cited. For example, Matthew, in the second chapter, quotes Hosea 11.1, 1, out of Egypt I called my son. Well, Hosea was not prophesying. He was talking about history. When Israel was a child, then I loved him, and I called my son out of Egypt, but then they rebelled, etc. And Matthew is giving a typological principle. As it happened with Israel, so also it happened with the Messiah. As it happened with Israel, God's son, so also it happened with M Messiah, God's greater son. So we have to understand how they're interpreted. But if the New Testament writers made void the words of the Old Testament prophets, then it's the New Testament writers that we have to rightly question. I would say a consistent interpretation sees they made nothing void whatsoever. They just gave further insight into the meaning of the prophets. Okay, thank you for that answer. Jesus came saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven, <clears throat> pardon me, has drawn near. The kingdom of heaven obviously is associated with temple, it, it's associated with priesthood. It's asso associated with restoration of Israel. Was Jesus, in predicting the imminent establishment of the kingdom, uh, was he correct to say 
that the kingdom truly had, or the establishment of that kingdom with all of the ancillary things that belong to it, was the establishment of the kingdom truly at hand when Jesus said that? Oh, absolutely. And, and again, this is a key that needs to be understood that I think is being missed, that the kingdom broke in. We have been in the transition age. We have been in the last days for these last 2,000 years. We have been living in the prophesied period, and we have not yet seen everything come to pass, hence the untils of the New Testament. Matthew 5, 17 to 20, with the untils that are there, that we have not yet seen everything spoken of by Moses and the prophets come to pass. The until of Luke 21, that we have not seen the end of the times of the Gentiles yet, and hence the full restoration of Israel. The until of Matthew 23, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The nation has not yet welcomed him back as Messiah. So we are in the transition age. It's such a key hermeneutic. Obviously, you're well aware of this. You differ with it. But we are in that, that time already and not yet. What does Paul say in Ephesians 1? We have the Spirit as the deposit of things to come. So very plainly, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 was literally looking forward to the putting on of immortality, and these physical bodies will be resurrected. He was plainly looking forward to that in 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, and written the only way it could be written, with expectation of these things happening with imminence and in his lifetime. But what is what do we get in 2 Timothy 4? He's not looking forward to that for himself. He knows he's going to die. Earlier, it seems that he's looking forward to the expectation, just like every generation does, because we are in that transition age. So we see some of the promises fulfilled, but clearly not all. On any interpretation of the prophets, letting them interpret themselves, we have not yet seen nation not learning war against uh, one another anymore, and on and on. So we're in the transition age already and not yet. That explains how the prophecies are coming to pass, but not yet fully realized. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, in light of the, of the statement that we're looking for the consummation, Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, the end of all things has drawn near. Now, we can use the word telos either as goal or termination, whichever we wish to use in that particular text. But he nonetheless says, and it would be interesting to me, I want to just make an observation. If we render it, if we render telos as goal, okay, what is the significance of Peter saying the goal of all things has drawn near? And I have a corollary question that I want to pose here right along with it, so don't answer yet. <laughs> or if he takes it, telos, as the termination, what is the sig significance of that? And now let me segue to First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 where Paul gives examples from the Old Testament, and he says, they, uh, unfortunately the King James is, uh, is a bad translation of that, they were types of us, is the literal translation, upon whom the ends, tell us, of the ages has come. Now I take that there as goal. Here is Paul seemingly, you can give, give us your explanation here, seemingly saying that the goal of all previous ages had arrived in the first century, not awaiting a consummation, but the goal of all the previous ages had arrived. This seems to me to agree perfectly with 1 Peter chapter 4. So what is your understanding of Paul saying that the goal of all pre previous ages was upon them, and that Peter saying that the telos had drawn near? Certainly. Again, th thanks for the, the question. And I think this will really help us work out where the fundamental differences are here. I absolutely affirm what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, what 1 Peter says in 1 Peter 1 in terms of the end of, of uh, the last days and what James Jacob says in the fifth chapter about the last days in 1 John, the second chapter about the last hour. Uh, so I affirm all these things, the end of all things at hand, even, even reading it, tell us it's in there, 1 Peter 4. I take those words seriously. I also take the other words seriously in terms of what is yet to come, the burning up of all the elements of the universe and a new heaven and new earth where there is righteousness, where there's no more sickness, where there's no more pain, where there's no more death, uh, pictured in Revelation 21, where there's universal knowledge of the glory of the Lord in Isaiah 11, and many of the passages I've alluded to. 
and not the salvation of the culmination of the salvation of the remnant, which is hardly a culmination, but rather the turning where those who are hardened are no longer hardened. And there is a national salvation of Israel, as, as Jeremiah speaks of in Jeremiah 31, 1, at that time, I'll be the God of all the nations of Israel. I take all those seriously, which then puts me in a certain holy tension. I believe it's a tension that Paul and Peter lived in that the Messiah has come, that he has risen from the dead, that the eternal age has broken in and is spreading through the earth, but is not yet fully realized. Isaiah 49 lays that out, where the Messiah appears to have failed in his mission to Israel. And the Lord says to him, not only will you regather the lost tribes of Israel, again, speaking of a national restoration, those that are lost are the ones who will be regathered, but you'll also be a light to the nations. Hence, Isaiah 42 speaks of a persevering until... So here's where I would differ. You would say that I do not literally take these words, 1 Peter 4, 1 Corinthians 10, and these other passages, 1 John 2, last hour, last days, because it's been this long period of time. Jesus is hardly coming quickly, hardly coming soon. I would say that you are not taking literally and clearly all of the passages about everything that is yet to happen and have to say that we're in the new heavens and the new earth. And Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4 was not speaking of our physical resurrection and on and on. I believe I put the two together rightly, that something of extraordinary importance did happen, that there was a great event that took place in the year 70, a cataclysmic event, but that is part of the story, that there has still been a scattering of the Jewish people, whereas God said the day would come when we would be scattered no more, that there still is a time when all the nations of the earth will come against Jerusalem that has not yet happened, Zechariah 12, and that there will be a national repentance, Zechariah 12, 10 to 13, 1, that the Messiah will come and put his feet on the earth. That has not yet come. We are waiting for his coming. So we are in that transition age. On the one hand, momentous things did happen in, in AD 70 that fulfill some of the expectation of shaking, but not all, because the whole world was not shaken. The whole world has not been renovated by fire and the universe. We do not have new heavens and new earth. So I take them all seriously. We are living in the last days. We're living in the last hour. And if you look at it, not so much in terms of chronological time, but a change in season where the end of the age has broken in and Messiah can come at any point along the way to establish his kingdom on the earth. That's the tension in which we live. I'm trying to take all of the words seriously. My contention to you would be in your careful exegesis, you're only taking some of them literally and others you're having to spiritualize. That would be my difference with your approach, sir. Thank you. Next question, a passage you brought up a few moments ago, uh, all things have not been fulfilled. I would like to allude to Matthew 5, 17 and 18, but I would ask you a preliminary question. Do you, Dr. Brown, observe the seventh day Sabbath do you make the pilgrimages to Jerusalem three times a year? Do you offer the animal sacrifices? Do, do you participate in those cultic practices of Old Covenant Israel and Torah? Sir, I was just in Jerusalem, and we were sacrificing animals. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, uh, no, no, I don't. Uh, I, I, I would break those down. Seventh-day Sabbath, I, I would look at in different ways for different reasons. But no, I, I do not— uh, practice all the commandments of the law given by Moses, nor do I believe there is an obligation to. So you're correct in your assumption. Okay, thank you so much. Shook me there for a minute. <laughs> okay, following on that then, Jesus said, not one jot, not one tittle shall pass from Torah, the law, until it is all fulfilled. Use the Greek word genetai, brought to pass. Now, Paul wrote, could speak of the new moons, feast days, and Sabbaths, as shadows of good things that are about to come. He uses the present tense, and he uses mellow with the infinitive. Blast de Bruner's uh, Greek grammar says that uh, meline with the infinitive indicates imminence. So here is Paul in Colossians chapter 2 saying that those new moons, feast days, and Sabbaths were, when he wrote, still shadows of the good things that are about to come. The shadows had to be brought to their reality, it seems to me, that's my understanding. You can correct me with your comments here uh, when I get directly to the question. If, quickly, okay, if the Sabbath foreshadowed ultimate rest, if the new moon's feast days and Sabbaths fore foretold final salvation, and if the sacrifices have been done away with, then do we not have resurrection do we not have the final salvation? How could any part of Torah, including the cultists, 
pass away, not be obligatory, without the typological foreshadowing nature, that which they foreshadowed, coming into full reality? Yeah, simple answer, because time is short. Jesus said he didn't come to abolish the law or the prophets. He was not only speaking of law, but speaking of law and prophets. And again, we look at the larger promises, which have not yet come to pass that the prophets spoke of. If Israel was physically scattered, and God said you'll be scattered no more, well, has that happened yet? No. If Israel will be physically scattered and regathered, then who does it? In other words, you can't simply say that the first part is literal, now the second part is spiritual. You can't make that division. It simply doesn't work. And that's why Peter says in Acts 3 that he will remain in heaven. Has the Messiah physically come and put his feet back on the earth, the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 14, Acts 1? No, he hasn't. He will remain in heaven until all of these things are fulfilled. So that's why I have a great eschatology of victory. I believe there'll be chaos, calamity, trouble, difficulty on earth. I believe in many cases there'll be apostasy and darkness. But I believe the light will shine as we get closer and closer and closer to the end when King Jesus does return and establish his kingdom here. So the law and the prophets must all be fulfilled. The Sinai covenant is over and God is dealing with us based on the new covenant and calling Israel to enter into that new covenant. It still has not done that, but that will happen. As surely as God has spoken, it will come to pass. All right, gentlemen, I wish to congratulate you both on uh, the the way in which the debate has been handled to this point. We have five-minute uh, closing statements, uh, I think, very clearly. If anyone's been listening very carefully, uh, they have been able to see that the hermeneutical issue is the central issue here. And uh, so I would imagine that will be uh, at the forefront in the closing statements. And so, Dr. Brown, if uh, you will be ready, uh, you will have uh, five minutes to give your closing statements, and then uh, Dr. Preston right after that. So, Dr. Brown, your closing, your closing comments. Great. Uh, terrific. Uh, first, Dr. White, thanks for taking time to, to moderate. I know you're busy as well. Thanks, Rich, for your help on the technical end as well. Uh, Dr. Preston, when you reached out to me and said I put a challenge out on the radio, a friendly challenge, and you wanted to take me up on it, uh, my office wrote back and said, glad to do it, but didn't know who you were. Went to your website, <laughs> saw that you were serious. But to me, it's about being fair. In other words, if someone's going to represent a position for the sake of the constituents, I, I want it to be fair. There are things I won't debate because they're not my area. So thank you for uh, living up to and even exceeding my expectations in terms of the seriousness and the holistic approach that you have and the drawing from Old Testament texts, which, of, of course, is my main scholarship lies there. So thank you for, for doing that very much. In closing, let me reiterate that my exegesis went through Romans 9 through 11, verse by verse in terms of key verses, in which we saw that Paul says that the Israel that is hardened, the Israel that has rejected the Messiah, will at the end be the Israel that turns back. Not the culmination of the remnant of Jews, but a final turning on the heels of the fullness of the Gentiles. I want to reiterate that what I laid out exegetically has still not been challenged with all respect to my esteemed opponent. Hardness is still on Israel. We have still not seen the fullness of the Gentiles. Therefore, Romans 11, 26, 27 remains future. Jewish people uh, that still remain opposed to the gospel, therefore, those promises still remain as something in the future to be looked towards as well. I also want to reiterate that the passage is about no more war on the earth. Jesus knew what that was speaking of. Matthew 10, he says, don't think I came to bring peace but a sword. This was the time for division. The time of peace was still to come. We have not gotten to a situation where there is no war on the earth. We have not gotten to a situation where there is universal knowledge of God. We have not yet been physically resurrected. The dead in Messiah have not been physically resurrected. We have not physically resurrected been transformed. We have not put on immortality. The Messiah has not come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who don't know God. And Paul said to the Thessalonians, your enemies are your fellow countrymen, just like our enemies are our fellow countrymen. That has not yet been dealt with in terms of that persecution. What we need to see, though, is the consistent language of the New Testament that the writers wrote in expectation of something in their lifetimes. Paul clearly is including himself in the we who will be alive and remaining when Jesus returns. But when we get to 2 
uh, Timothy, the fourth chapter, we see that he knows that he will be gone. First Peter four, you could certainly make the case that Peter expected the culmination of everything in his lifetime. And yet now in second Peter, we see that he's talking about patient waiting and how he's going to put off this tent. And that's why Jesus gives parables about the waiting, the longing, and, and it looks like he's not going to come back. If everything happened in the year 70, all of these words become null and void. I want to go back to the principle I laid out earlier, that the God who scattered is the God who regathers. Was there a literal scattering of the Jewish people? Yes. Was there a literal judgment on Jerusalem in AD 70? Yes. Was there a little literal taking of Jewish people into captivity around the world, especially with the second Jewish revolt, 132 to 135? Yes. Has God said it will end there? No. Have we been scattered throughout the world? Yes. Are we in the process of being regathered? Yes. Who's doing it? The same God who said that he will be the God of all the families of Israel. Again, what we need to understand is the principle of already and not yet. The kingdom of God has broken in. The world to come has broken in. We have one foot in that world and one foot in this world. Jesus comes to deliver us from present evil. He de comes to destroy the works of Satan, Galatians 1, 1 John 3. And yet we must still consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God. We are seated with heavenly places in Messiah, yet we must put to death the deeds of the body. It is the same. Redemption has come, but it has not yet been fully realized by Israel. I encourage you to read through Romans 9 through 11 carefully, prayerfully, to ask the question, is the fullness of the Gentiles come in yet? Ask the question, is there still hardness on Israel? Ask the question, has all Israel been saved yet in accordance with it? Ask the question, have we come to the point of the universal knowledge of God and no more war on the earth? Have we come to the place where we have put on mortality and physically become like Jesus in his resurrected form? The answer to those questions is categorically no, in which case, I'm excited because I get to look forward to all these things that are yet to happen. As surely as judgment came in AD 70, final redemption will yet come to Israel. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Michael Brown. In our debate today, there is only one section left, and that is Dr. Preston's closing five-minute statements. Dr. Preston, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Brown, I appreciate what you said, that when I contacted you about a debate, you didn't know who in the world I was. That's fine. <laughs> That's to be expected. Uh, but I do appreciate so much uh, the uh, more than magnanimous and, and gracious uh, reception here, the wonderful discussion. Uh, I try to be a very ser serious student of God's Word. Uh, I try to take a holistic approach. And Dr. White, thank you again for moderating this debate. We do appreciate your time, appreciate everyone that's involved. Okay, let, let me see if I can close. I have pointed out that Paul's uh, prophetic background, prophetic source in Romans chapter 11, 25 and following, was in fact Isaiah 27, Isaiah 59, Jeremiah 31, and Daniel chapter 9, 24 and following. I demonstrated that Isaiah chapter 27 and Isaiah 59 foretold the salvation of Israel at the time of judgment of Israel for shedding innocent blood. I pointed out that Jesus' emphatic words were that the avenging of the blood of all the righteous all the way back to creation was going to occur in the judgment of Israel in the first century. Now, since Paul is appealing to Isaiah 27 and Isaiah 59 for his prediction of the salvation of Israel, but since Isaiah 27 and Isaiah 59 coupled their prophecy of the salvation of Israel to the judgment of Israel, to the time of the judgment of Israel for shedding innocent blood. And since Jesus unequivocally posits that time of the vindication of all of the blood of all the righteous in AD 70, I believe that we are forced exegetically, linguistically, and textually to see the, the salvation of Israel however we might even perceive it to be, as occurring in that time of judgment, which was, of course, again, a time of salvation. Jesus himself said in Luke chapter 21, as he described the fall of Jerusalem, he said to his disciples, when you see these things take place, rejoice, lift up your heads, for your redemption is near. Redemption being, by the way, in a second Exodus motif that I think, boy, I'd love to develop that just an awful lot more. I touched on a hermeneutic uh, well, let me return here. We talked about Daniel chapter 9, and 70 weeks were determined to put away sin. Well, 
Kenneth Gentry has pointed out that in t the infinitival uh, form of the Hebrew in that text demands that it's the process of making the atonement, not necessarily the application. Now, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but I've read several other Hebrew scholars who concur in that assessment. So therefore, Daniel 9 is concerned with the process of making the atonement, the cultic uh, actions, if you please, and confines that to the 70 weeks, which my good friend here, Dr. Brown, has agreed was consummated in AD 70. We therefore have this reality. The time of the putting away of the sin of Israel is confined to the 70 weeks. The 70 weeks ended no later than AD 70. Therefore, the putting away of Israel's sin in Romans chapter 11 occurred no later than AD 70. Because, again, the language of Daniel chapter 9 is the cultic praxis of making atonement. It is not the application of that. Number three, or number four, excuse me, and that's the new covenant. I pointed out how the new covenant is the promise of the remarriage. And I pointed out how Yahweh had divorced the ten northern tribes. He promised to, to remarry her in the last days. Jesus appeared in the last days, Hebrews chapter 1. Judah had to be divorced in the same way that the ten northern tribes were. We see the divorcement of Judah throughout the entirety of Jesus' parabolic ministry. We see it in Revelation, as I pointed out. But what do we find? We find the time of the wedding when? When those servants who rejected the offer to the wedding killed the servants and then themselves were slain and their city was destroyed by fire. I think Donald Hagner expressed it very well in the word biblical commentary when he says any reader of this could not, could not imagine that this did not apply to AD 70. Well, if that's correct, then, and I think it obviously is, then you have the wedding at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, which comports and agrees perfectly with Revelation chapter 18 and 19, that at the destruction of Babylon, the city where the Lord was slain, the city guilty of killing the prophets, the city guilty of killing the apostles and prophets of Jesus, filling the measure of sin, she is destroyed, and the victory song is sung, let us rejoice, for the time of the wedding has come. This is the fulfillment, in fact, of Romans chapter 11, 25 to 27. I wish we had more time, but my time is up. Thank you so much again for allowing me to be here. All right. Thank you very much to both Dr. Michael Brown and Dr. Don Preston for a stimulating conversation. I think everyone has seen that the hermeneutical issues are central in this particular discussion, and you have been given two uh, very excellent presentations from those perspectives. Thank you for joining us today, and God bless. God bless. God bless.